Welcome. This is the first part of a series where we're going to talk about the pharmacodynamics of infectious, infectious diseases agents. I think this is a fascinating topic. It's a fairly new um, area and has revolutionized how we utilize um, antibiotics and antimicrobials under going back to things that we actually knew for a while, but kind of putting it together um, using our understanding of how drugs work um, with pharmacokinetics to improve um, outcomes in patients with um, infectious diseases. So <clears throat> we've got three things involved here. We've got the pathogen and where it is. So if it's a pneumonia, it's in the lung, if it's in whatever the pathogen is. Um, and then we've got the antibiotic. We've got the kinetics and the dynamics of the antibiotic, which is what we're going to talk about mostly today. And then we've got the patient who has the clinical condition and has particular pharmacokinetics that drive how that particular patient will utilize the drug. So we've got three individual, three individual um, parts here. The patient the drug, and then, of course, the bug and where, it's, where it is. So this is what's different than um, other uh, types of um, drug therapies. Um, most of these concepts you know, but I'm going to go over them quickly. First, you know what pharmacokinetics are. You know what pharmacodynamics are. Minimum inhibit, well, maybe I'll go over those quickly. Kinetics is how you describing drugs and how they behave. In other words, um, how, how the drug, um, how the body affects the drug, right? So how does the, the physiology of the human being affect the, how the drug behaves? And pharmacodynamics is the relationship between the drug once it's gotten there, <coughs> excuse me, at some site, and the antimicrobial effect that it has. <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. You um, all have taken microbiology, so you know that the minimum inhibitory concentration, or the MIC, and probably Dr. Shin's talked about this already, is the minimum concentration that, of the antibiotic that inhibits the bacterial growth. So minimum concentration where inhibition of growth, not killing, but in inhibit of, inhibition of growth occurs <clears throat> after 16 to 20 hours of growth, and this is done in vitro. Your MBC, or your minimum bactericidal concentration, is just that. It's the lowest concentration of antibiotic that will kill 99.9% .9 of growth. So not just inhibit the growth, but kill the bug for after a 16 to 20 hour exposure. Your Cmax, of course, is your peak concentration that you reach of the drug. Area under the curve, you know, is the amount of drug that's delivered over a period of time and it's an exposure um, measure. Now an antibiotic must reach the binding site of the microbe to interfere with its life cycle. That's how they work. So they have to get to the microbe itself or else they won't do anything. Um, and they must occupy enough or a sufficient number of those active sites to either inhibit or kill the bug. It must reside on that active site for enough time. So it has to get there, it has to occupy enough of the active sites, and it has to be for long enough. They are not contact poisons. In other words, they don't have, antibiotics don't just touch the bug and kill it. <clears throat> you know what static versus cytal is, right? So if we gave a, uh, if we grew a, grew a bug, so the, the y-axis here is colony forming units, and we allowed the, the uh, bacteria to just grow, obviously those colony forming units would increase with time. Um, if we gave some sort of inhibition, it might slow it down a little bit. If we gave a static drug, that would stop it from, from uh, growing, but it's still it's still there, and then cytal is actually getting rid of the drug. So static versus cytal is a pretty big distinction in what it does, and this would um, be even more cytal. <clears throat> so 
what are the questions we need to ask when we're picking an antibiotic? Can this antibiotic inhibit or kill these bacteria? Can that antibiotic reach the site that it needs to in order to inhibit those um, sites? What concentration of the antibiotic is needed to inhibit or kill the bacteria? And will that antibiotic kill better or faster if we increase its concentration? And do we need to keep that antibiotic concentration always high or can it decrease? Um, so how do we figure this out? Well, in vitro susceptibility testing helps us with that. Um, <clears throat> we can mix bacteria with different antibiotics at different concentrations and see what happens to the bacterial growth, right? You probably did this in the lab, right? You can plate the bug and put in some antibiotic and see what the zone inhibition is and get some sort of idea um, if, the, if, if the bacteria will be inhibited or killed by the antibiotic. How do we know what concentration is needed to inhibit or kill? Again, in vitro offers some help. Um, of course, the concentrations have to be above the minimum inhibitory concentration. So if your MIC is here, the, this period of time, right here it's not going to be effective, here it's not going to be effective, here it's not going to be effective. Um, so you want to have the concentrations above the MIC. But how much above the MIC do they have to be? Could they just ride right along above the MIC, or does it help to have them higher than the MIC? And how long do they have to be above the MIC? Again, we know it's not contact kill, um, but some, drug, some bugs need longer periods of time, and bugs, bug drug combinations need longer periods of time um, above the MIC. So there's several kind of buckets that we put drug bug combinations into. One is a concentration dependent killer. A concentration dependent killer needs very high uh, concentration MIC ratios to be effective. And it's sort of like a, um, a sort of like a um, knockout punch. Again, they're not contact poisons, but you need a very high C-max to MIC ratio for it to be effective, and it doesn't have to hang out there for a long period of time, but you do want that high C-max to MIC um, ratio, and that's called concentration-dependent killing. The higher the concentration, the greater the kill. I don't know why that little arrow did that. This includes aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, ketolides, metronidazole, and amphotericin. The higher the concentration, the better the kill. Then there's your time-dependent killers. Your time-dependent killers, I think, of more like radiation. You just want to have enough drug around uh, sufficiently high over the MIC to uh, kill the bug. You don't have to. It just needs time to kill. still has to be above the MIC. So it needs to be four times the MIC, and the longer the exposure, the more the killing. This includes beta-lactams, glycopeptides, clindamycin, macrolides, tetracycline, and Bactrim. And then the last but not least are uh, combinations of those two. Um, but those are the two big ones. I want to go back a minute. So concentration-dependent killer and time-dependent killer. And then we also have drugs that are kind of mixtures of these two. Vancomycin is probably more in this time-dependent kill section, too. Uh, Post-antibiotic effect is called is usually what we call persistence effects, which means that the uh, the bacterial uh, antibacterial effect of the drug continues even after the concentration has fallen below uh, MICs and after the antimicrobial exposure. So there's continues to be suppression of bacteria even after the drug. Is, has uh, left the tissue. There's a moderate to, pro to prolonged persistent effect, or what we call post-antibiotic effect, to all gram-positive um, bugs in vitro in the lab. So gram-positive organisms have a fairly moderate to prolonged post-antibiotic effect. Um, 
There's also uh, a moderate to prolonged post-antibiotic effect for gram negatives for uh, protein and nucleic acid synthesis, synthesis inhibitors. Um, but there's not much for gram negatives for beta-lactams in general. Beta-lactams are cell wall inhibitors, um, don't have much of a uh, post-antibiotic effect, except carbapenem seem to have a post-antibiotic effect against Pseudomonas. Um, so, and there's also the post-antibiotic sub-MIC effect. So the prolonged drug level, even below the MIC, augments the post-antibiotic effect. Um, there's also a post-antibiotic leukocyte killing enhancement. So the leukocytes are also seem to be enhanced um, after the drug leaves the dr leaves the uh, body. So there's augmentation of intracellular killing by the leukocytes. So the leukocytes are more effective. Um, so you, so we think that's one of the reasons that we see the persistent effects. So the longest uh, PAE we see is with antibiotics that have this leukocyte killing enhancement. So these antibiotics seem to make the white cells more um, effective. All right. So patterns of antimicrobial activity. Um, here's where, when we have concentration dependent killers, um, most of them have moderate to prolonged persistent effects. So the aminoglycosides, uh, amphotericin, those drugs um, have moderate to prolonged persistent effects, which means that we can get that high concentration and allow the concentrations then to fall off. And still, even after it, the concentration's fallen below the MIC, we still think that it probably continues to be effective. So we want to maximize those concentrations. And the peak, the pr pharmacokinetic parameter we would look at would be the uh, Cmax to MIC ratio. And the area of the curve would also be helpful. But mostly we're looking at the Cmax to MIC ratio. So the aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, et cetera. The time-dependent killers, again, um, and any drug that has um, minimal or moderate post-antibiotic effects, the goal of dosing here would be the maximization during, of the concentrations being over the MIC, four times the MIC um, for the whole time of exposure, or as much of the um, time as possible should be above. So the pharmacokinetic parameter determining efficacy here would be the time above the MIC. So examples here are beta-lactams, macrolides, clindamycin, flucytosine, uh, and linazolid, and vancomycin, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not right. Time-dependent killers with prolonged persistent effects. Here, we want to optimize the amount of drug. And so here, we're looking at area into the curve. So here's azithromycin, vancomycin, tetracyclines, and fluconazole, sorry. So PKPD patterns, we know that here's our concentration time, here's our curves, concentration increases, we get our C max and decreases. Here's our area of the curve, here's our, our peak concentrations. So we can see uh, peak concentration to MIC ratio would be one thing, area of the curve would be another. Um, area to the curve above the MIC would be another thing we could look at. Time above the MIC would be another thing we could look 